Hey guys, welcome to Hope. Hope the Ruby edition. It's like Hope, what, number 14? We do this series every year because we all need to be inspired to dream, to not give up, that there is hope. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen, Hebrews chapter 11, verse one says, and that is what this series is all about. So we're glad you're here, whether you're a guest or you hang out around here all the time, you really are in to uh, in for an amazing service. Thanks for coming today. All right, I'd like to start off with a question as I always do. Raise your hand if you're married. Go ahead, raise it up high. If your hand's not up, it's okay. You're single, better to be single. I didn't tell you to put your hands down, but be proud. Better to be single than with the wrong person, right? All right, good, put your hands down. A lot of married people here today. How many of you are in a happy marriage? Raise your hand. Oh my goodness, this is very telling. <laughs> okay, put your hands down quickly. Not as many hands up this time as the first question. It's like, you know, I can just imagine those discussions on the way home at lunch. Why didn't you put your hands up? You don't think you're happy. <laughs> now, I do want to apologize to our translator who's a translating in sign. By the way, that's awesome. And because I'm going to say things that don't quite translate into sign language. It's going to be weird phrases and things. So I apologize. And to our translation team there, I use different expressions and things. So hopefully it translates. But I'm glad you're here. I really am. Because I hope that when you leave today, whether you're married or not, you're going to have renewed, renewed hope. But we live in a world where marriage is not seen very, very kindly, is it? It's like when you watch TV and movies, they treat marriage as more of a prison sentence. All right, like something, well, we've dated long enough, we might as well just get what? Married. Clink, right? You see the T-shirts with the husband and the wife picture, and it says game over underneath it. Right, we, li we live in a world where marriage is kind of seen that way. Is it? Once you're married, it's, it's done. You're locked in, same person, every day, day in and day out. And then we come up with cute phrases like the one I put there in your outline. Now, don't say it out loud. Resist the temptation. But it says, happy wife. Don't say it. Fill in what you think belongs in the next part. Happy wife. You guys can't resist, can you? <coughs> happy wife. What did you write there? No, the correct answer is happy wife is impossible. <laughs> is impossible. That is the correct answer. So if you wrote anything else... It's incorrect, no, it's happy life, okay? Do me a favor, all right, underneath that, you see the next one, happy husband. Go ahead and write down that. Well, happy husband, blank, you know this one. If you need to cheat off your neighbor, you can. Happy husband, you know this one. No, you don't know this one, you know why? <laughs> because there's no answer, nobody cares. If you're a husband, your happiness means nothing. <laughs> nothing. Just put a big X through that, it doesn't matter. <laughs> My wife said that the reason that people can't answer that is because nothing rhymes with husband. I said, no, they can't answer that because there's no answer to it. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Look at this quote. I put it there in your outline. It's from Bettina Arndt. And she says, women hope men will change after marriage. And what? They don't. Men hope women won't change. But they do. <laughs> Amen, we're done. Right? <laughs> It's so true, right? right? A lot of times women will marry these fixer-upper guys and I'll get them to where I need them to be and that doesn't work, does it? And then we, you know, a lot of guys are dating a girl and she's fun and adventurous and free-spirited and we marry them and it's over, <laughs> right? It happens, it, again, these are stereotypes and, and big, big expressions and stuff. It doesn't always work out that way. But boy, that's true. And if we're not careful, we start becoming roommates with our spouse instead of husband and wife. I mean, we hang out, we know each other, they're, they're friends of ours, but we lose that hope, that intimacy that we once started long ago when we first said, I do. We lose hope that we're ever gonna be able to communicate better. We lose hope that we're ever gonna be able to be on the same page about our children or our faith. We lose hope on, 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 on trusting again. Hope leaks if we're not careful. Because that day you said I do and you stood in front of that pastor or whatever, whoever you stood in front of and you said I do and you made that promise to your spouse, man, there's so much hope that day, wasn't there? We're gonna have the greatest marriage ever. This is gonna be an incredible run, you and I together forever. And you look into their eyes and just this love and it's just, ooh, it's a Hallmark movie, it's beautiful. And then life. The easiest part of a marriage is the wedding, isn't it? The marriage is a tough part. But if we're not careful, that hope starts to leak out 
and we find ourselves needing the hope to come back. That's what we're going to talk about today. How to bring, how to return hope back to your marriage. Um, do me a favor, fill in this, number one, we need to evaluate where our marriage is now. We need to evaluate where our marriage is now. This is the first step to restoring hope to your marriage. Pastor Troy a few weeks ago shared a story about uh, GPSs. He talked about that in order for a GPS to work, to tell you where, how to get to where you wanna go, guess what it has to know first? Where you are. It needs to know your location before it can give you directions as to how to get there. Same thing in life. Same thing for our marriage. We need to know where we are in order for us to know where we need to go. And I wanna talk about that using the example right out of scripture. What should a marriage look like? Because I mean, how many of you sit over dinner and look at your spouse and go, sweetheart, let's evaluate where our marriage is right now. It, let's talk about how you're dropping the ball as my husband. You ever talk to your husband and like, no, you shouldn't. You ever look at your wife and say, sweetheart, you're missing it. You're not doing what you need. You don't, why don't we have those discussions with our spouses? Because they cause fights, don't they? Somebody sleeps on the couch, it's, it's raised voices, it's not a good place to be. But we have to once in a while evaluate where we are. Now let's look at scripture. Now why are we using the Bible to evaluate where we are? Because God himself created marriage. It's his idea. So there's no greater place to go than look at the original source, what God had intended for us to be as a husband and as a wife, what our roles are scripturally. And there's two passages there, one's from the book of Ephesians chapter five, and the other one's from 1 Peter three. They're in your outline, not on the screens. First one says, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So he's saying husbands and wives, first of all, submit to one another. For wives, this means to submit to your husbands. Submit to your husbands. Underline that if you would. I like that. We're gonna explain it, don't worry. As to the Lord, for a husband is the head of his wife. Underline that too. Or don't. Nobody's moving pens anyway. You're like, no, I'm not underlining that. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now we're gonna explain all this in a minute. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Huge passage there. Did you see it though? There's some roles of a husband and a roles of a wife there in that passage. Let's look at 1 Peter 3. It says, in the same way you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. In the same way you husbands must give honor to your wives, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your, underline this, equal partner, equal partner in God's gift of new life. So what are our responsibilities biblically as husband and wife? Let's start with wife first, okay? Three things that a wife should be according to scripture. I didn't write this, so don't get mad at me yet. You'll have time later to get mad at me, but don't get mad at me yet. This is right out of the scriptures. What a wife should be. Number one, they should submit to their husband's, important here, spiritual authority. Please fill that in. Wives should submit to their husband's spiritual authority, and here's why that is. If you are a husband in the room today, the Bible, has said that you, the Bible says that you are the pastor of the home. It is your responsibility as the man, as the husband, devotions with your kids, taking them to church, praying together as a family, that all rests on you. You are, as a husband, biblically, the pastor of the home. So if you're a wife, the Bible says you're supposed to submit to spiritual authority. This does not mean submit to all authority. This does not mean that your husband gets to call every shot because men love to take this out of context. In fact, to the point where people don't want me putting it in wedding vows. I'm not obeying. Did you have obey in your wedding vows? Probably not, not these days. Obedience simply means this, that women should follow their husbands in their spiritual authority as to the Lord. Here's the second thing. Women, wives, excuse me, should be a godly example. Wives should be a godly example. This means living out their faith, love, grace, forgiveness, peace, all these things that are important. And I wanna challenge you, the Bible says that wives should live out their faith. You might be in a home where you're the only one with faith in your home. And you have to live out your faith in front of your husband who doesn't believe at all. I wanna challenge you to keep living out your faith. Because they're getting more than you understand. They're seeing this happen. They're seeing you live out your faith in a genuine way. Don't give up doing that. They're absorbing more than you think they are. But the Bible tells us that we need to live out as wives your faith in front of your husband. Third one and the final one for, for women, for the wives. 
Wives should live purely and respectfully. Wives should live purely and respectfully. This means that when you respond to your husband, you're not sarcastic or putting them down. Respect is very important to your husband. He may never state that to you, but it is. The Bible says, again, I didn't write this. The Bible says that we need to be respectful. Even if he's wrong, be respectful in the way you respond. Being an example of Christ to him. So ladies, if you're married, how'd you do? I'm not gonna ask you to hold up one, two, or three fingers as to how many you got right or how many you're currently doing, but you know whether you measure up or not to the biblical standard of a biblical wife. Now let's look at biblical husbands. Husbands, you're supposed to love your wife like Christ loves the church. Love your wife like Christ loves the church. How does Christ love the church? Christ died for the church. Christ protects the church. Christ provides for the church. It's everything. That's the level of love you have for your wife. Sacrificial, complete, whole. That's the love Christ has for the church. That's a tall order for, for husbands. But the Bible says that's the, that's the first step to bringing hope back is loving your wife like Christ loves the church. Here's another one for the husbands. Husbands should sacrifice for their wives willingly. Sacrifice for their wives willingly. Now I wanna give you an example of this. This just shows you how holy I am. The other night we had um, pizza and we ordered garlic bread. And garlic, there were garlic rolls, okay? And there was one garlic roll left in the bag. I left that for my wife. Yeah, I know, I am holier than you. <laughs> now it's a silly example, but I'll tell you this, guys, if, you, if you're the one that reaches into the bag and scarfs that roll down and doesn't offer it to your wife, it's a stupid example, but it sends a definite message, doesn't it? Guys, we're supposed to be sacrificing willingly. What does she want me to do? Not resentfully, not conditionally. I'll do this if you do this for me. That's not what the Bible says. Husbands are sacrificing willingly. The last one for guys. Husbands, you should be honoring your wife and understanding of her needs. Here's what that means. You are gonna speak well of your wife when she's not even in the room. When the guys at work are bashing their wives, you're not joining in. You're defending your wife. This is what honor means. It's, it's, it's easy to honor your wife when you have an ulterior motive. It's easy to honor your wife when she's even in the room. It's much tougher to do so when you don't have to. If we wanna bring hope back to our marriages, husbands, we need to step up in this area to honor our wives and understand their needs. So married husbands, how did you do? You only you know, I'm not gonna ask you to hold up a score, but you know and I know how we're doing against what the Bible says a husband and a wife should be. And why is this important? Because if we're gonna know where we have to go, we have to know where we need improvement. We have to know where to move forward. Now there was some things in there that you might have noticed that were for both. Look at there, I put them there in your outline. We need to submit to one another. This is both husband and wife. Submit to one another. Decision making should be a group. The two of you together. Not the kids, but the two of you together, submitting to one another. The second part is we need to treat each other as equal partners. This means we should never, ever speak down to each other. Because I've talked to a lot of couples. I'm not a counselor, as you'll find out soon enough. But I pray with couples, and, and I've watched a husband or I've watched a wife speak to their spouse in a way that, like a toddler, I told you to sit over there, don't move. You're grown. A husband and wife should never speak to each other like that. Like there's somebody who's intellectually superior over the other. Well, I'm the man, so I should have this right. Or I'm the woman, so I know better than you. And I have this intuition. And I have this background. None of that matters. What does the scripture say? Submit to one another and treat each other as equal partners. Is your marriage equal partners? Don't raise your hand or nod your head, but you know. Are you creating an environment in your marriage where your spouse feels like an equal? Or do they feel like they constantly have to prove themselves to you? Again, we need to know where we are in order to bring hope moving forward. I put this in your notes. Every marriage, every marriage can be better than it is right now. Would you agree with that? Whether you've been married 25 years or 25 minutes. My wife and I, August 1st of this year, will be 25 years married. Incredible. Oh, thanks. That's for her. 
Being married to a pastor is no picnic, I'm sure. And um, she's an incredible woman of God. And I can stand in front of you and tell you today that if it wasn't for my wife, I would not only not be a pastor, I would not be a quarter of the man that I am. I say that not to butter her up because she's back there. She did not write that. I say it with all the sincerity of my heart. My prayer for you is that you have that person with you right now. And if you don't, they can become that person. It just takes some work. We're going to talk all about that. How to restore the hope back. All of us can get better at this stuff. I'm not the perfect husband. I've never met the perfect husband. All of us can be better than we are. Here's, how do we do that, though? How do we bring hope back? Well, let's look at number two. We need to stop wishing and start working. Stop wishing and start working. As I said before, I'm not a marriage counselor, but once in a while I'll talk to couples up here at the front or I'll pray with you in the lobby and people will walk up to me and say, Pastor, my marriage is hopeless. It's falling apart. And what they want me to do is not, they want me to fix it. I mean, I, I don't know. If you've been married 10 years and you've had 10 years of a struggling marriage, I can't fix it in the lobby. I, there's no magical solution. I mean, I, I think people want me to say, okay, do this. Take a Bible, put it in your husband's pillowcase. You'll never know it's there. And when he sleeps on it at night, it'll just absorb into his head all the things that God wants to tell. Look, there's no magical solution to your marriage. There just isn't. You can't fix it in an afternoon or one message like this one. It's over a period of time, and there's, there's a process to it, which we're going to unpack in a minute. People want that quick fix. So I, I, every time somebody says my marriage is hopeless, I ask them two things. I say, how involved is God in your marriage? That's the first question I'm always going to ask. Is God the center of your marriage? Number two, the second question I ask is, what are both of you doing to make things better? Oh, pastor, you don't understand. We're doing a lot of stuff to improve our marriage. We rented the movie Fireproof. And we went to two marriage conferences, and we went to this, we, we, you know, we, we see a marriage therapist, and, and, uh, and, and, and we pray and all that, but nothing's happening. Our marriage must be doomed. Now, there's something missing out of that whole list I just gave you. Did you notice what it was? Now, if you missed it, I'm going to point it out to you here in Joshua chapter 3. It's right here in Scripture. The important thing missing from that list now, let me give you the scene before I read you this passage. The Israelites are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, that big gold box from Raiders of the Lost Ark, the movie, if you haven't seen it, 1980, great flick, right? Carrying the big gold box, and they're walking across the desert, and they gotta get this big box, which has the Ten Commandments in it, across the Jordan. The Jordan River is overflowing its banks, and they're gonna drown if they try to, and what God tells them to do is get to the edge of the water, put their foot in, and the waters will part, and they can walk the, the Ark across it. Let's see what happens. I put it in your outline from Joshua chapter three. This first sentence is not in your outline, but it picks up. It says, so the people left their camp to cross the Jordan, and the priests who were carrying the ark went ahead of them. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water, the water above that point began backing up. Did you notice what happened? How did, why did the waters part? Because, I mean, the priests could have come up with the, with the ark and said, okay, water. Okay, Jordan, go ahead. God, um, I'm, I'm here. Part the water. I mean, give me the, come on. What did the priest have to do? Had to step in. The water didn't move till he took action, and that's what's missing from the list. All these things are wonderful. Marriage counseling is wonderful. Marriage books are wonderful. Fireproof is great. Prayer is fantastic. But if you're sitting and waiting for your marriage to get better passively, you're wasting your time. You've got to put into action some of the things you're learning. You gotta do something differently than you're doing before, because I get all the time, we gave our marriage to the Lord. Great, what does that mean? God cares a lot about your marriage, but you know what he's waiting for you to do? Put your foot in the water and change something. It's like, you know, I wanna become better at my finances. I'm just gonna give my finances to God, and then I'm gonna go out and run up a credit card. It doesn't work that way. Change doesn't happen that way. It requires an action step. Now you know why they call it an action step, right? Stepping into the Jordan. I don't know if that's really why they call it, but that's brilliant. I just came up with that just now. Must be the cold medicine. <laughs> Gotta apply what we learn. Because it's easy to say, well, you know what? I've just, I just turned it over to God. Yeah, God, in fact, put this in your notes. I wrote it in your, fill in the blank. God blesses our marriages through our actions, not our intentions. I want a better marriage. God says, I want to give you one. 
What are you doing? How are you making it better? What action steps are you taking? It's great to rent, you know, to, to rent a movie, or like a great one, or, or read a book on marriage, but you gotta apply it. Application matters. So what do we need to start doing? I've given you three actions, three actions to stop doing and three actions to start doing. And I'll start with a negative first. Here's three things that every marriage should stop doing, okay? Number one, please fill this in. Marriages need to stop oversharing. Oversharing, please fill that in. What do I mean by oversharing? There are some people in the room that love to vomit their marriage problems out all over their friends. All over their coworkers. Oh, he's this. Oh, she's that. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, our marriage is terrible. And you know they don't talk to you know who they don't talk to about it? Their spouse. And one day their spouse is sitting at work and he, you know, pulls up a seat next to his buddy and says, Hey, your wife called my wife last night. Having a problem in the bedroom, huh? <laughs> That's not a discussion you want to have. Why should you ever be in that position? Keep your marriage problems in the marriage. Don't overshare. Because it feels good to get it out, but it doesn't create intimacy with your spouse. Now, why don't we want to have discussions like this? Why do we want to sit over dinner and discuss the deep issues? Because sometimes it leads to arguments, doesn't it, or fights. And I hear from people all the time, Pastor, we never fight as a couple. And I always look at them and I say, you know why? Because you don't talk about anything deep enough to fight about. Arguments and disagreements, if they're handled in a healthy way, can bring intimacy and healing to a relationship. Just because it's hard to do doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And don't give me this, guys don't express their feelings junk either. Your marriage is worth expressing the way you feel in a calm, adult, grown-up way. And if you didn't marry a grown-up, pray for them. I hope you did. It's important to have these discussions with our spouse, but it's gotta be the right timing, right? It's gotta be the right tone of voice, because that matters, no matter what you're saying, if it's the wrong tone of voice, it can ruin it. And it's also gotta be the right group of people. Don't do it around their friends or her friends. The time to discuss your marital problems is not at dinner with the family. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Timing's important, okay? So we gotta stop oversharing. We also have to stop comparing. Please write that in. We have to stop comparing. Pastor Tyler talked about this last week, that a lot of us compare our relationships to Instagram. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever done that. You check through Instagram and happy family, happy family, happy family. You know, it's couples out there doing board surfing and climbing the Alps and stuff, and you're like, that's awesome. Or maybe you see the picture, you know, Sunday fun day, you know, snap, and you see that photo and you're like, man, I wanna be them. What you didn't see was a shouting match in the van driving all the way to the beach before they took the Sunday fun day snap. Now knock it off, we're smiling, we're happy, we love each other, Sunday fun day. The marriage that you wish you had, they have problems too. They do. We gotta stop comparing ourselves to other couples. We also have to, within our marriages, stop comparing our spouse to past relationships, ever. Never look at your wife and say, man, my ex-girlfriend, she was kinder than you're being to me right now. Don't do that. My ex-husband, he never talked to me like that. Don't, don't, don't. And here's one too. Never compare your spouse to their parents. A good conversation starter is not this, this statement. You're as stubborn as your mother. Don't say it. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Comparison does not lead to a good place. People are always like, hey, the grass is greener over there. It's not. Remember the expression, the grass is greener where you water it. Take all that energy that you're spending comparing yourself to somebody else and pour it into your own relationship and pretty soon you'll see changes. Somebody's looking at your Instagram feed thinking they want what you have anyway. Keep straight on this. I mean, it's important. So many of us start comparing and we start, it falls apart. Here's the third thing to stop. This is an important one. If you're doing this, stop scaring. Stop scaring. That means never threaten, bully, manipulate or use guilt on your spouse, ever. That means posture, body posture. That means tone of voice. That means using something that they used to do a long time ago and beating them with it as a weapon. Manipulation, these things don't belong in a marriage filled with hope. 
If you find yourself doing that, if you find yourself that's the only way you can communicate with your spouse is by bullying and manipulation, I say this with all the sincerity I can, please get some help. Even if you saw it modeled in your own parents, if that's the way they talk to each other, don't treat your spouse like that. And as a little quick aside that's important, whether you're male or female, if you find yourself in a relationship that's become physically abusive, Separate from that person until that person gets enough help. You don't deserve it. It's not, it's not something you have coming to you. And stop saying they don't know any better. I'm not saying divorce the person. I am saying get yourself in a safe place. Because I talk to too many people who come to me and they say, Pastor, they just don't know what they're doing. They just don't mean it. And every single day they get hit or kicked or bruised, there's no reason for that. There's no reason for that. Important, if hope's ever gonna come back, we need to get the help we need. We gotta stop scaring each other as a couple. All right, now those are three things to stop. Let's do it to three things to start. Number one, we need to start praying for each other. Here's what I mean by that though, because a lot of us wanna pray, like for example, if a wife is praying for her husband, she may pray, dear Lord in heaven, make my husband as sensitive as that guy in the notebook. I want that guy, <laughs> not a good prayer. Or I've heard guys, dear Lord, they get down on one knee, dear Lord, please increase my wife's sex drive, please. <laughs> That's not the prayer I'm talking about. You know how you should be praying for your spouse? Not that God would change them, that God would bless them, that God would favor them, that God would protect them, that God would make them feel you know, just great about life. Because it's awfully hard to be mad at someone when you spend all day praying that God would bless them. So stop taking all those prayers and saying, God changed my husband, God changed my wife. The prayer is, God bless my husband. Watch over my wife, bless her. It's important if we're gonna move forward in hope. Because you know what's gonna happen? If we're praying those kinds of prayers for our spouses, God's gonna change, not them, God's gonna change us. When our prayers change, God works on our heart. Here's the second thing. Please fill this in. We need to start prioritizing. Start prioritizing. Make your spouse a priority. This is one of the things I think a lot of couples struggle with is priority. For a lot of, a lot of couples, I ask couples, what are your priorities? How, what's your list? They say, oh, it's of course, because they're speaking to me as a pastor. It's God. Okay, we'll put God there. And then right below God, we put the kids. And right below the kids, we put our spouse. And right below the spouse, we put me or your, them or whoever, you know, them, themselves. And I look at them and I say, you know what, though? Biblically, you put your kids over your spouse. So what does the Bible say? When a husband and a wife, when they marry, they become what? They become one. Did you know you're not one with your kids? You're never supposed to be one with your kids. That's not the way God designed it. The, the, the godly biblical priority is this. God, your spouse, your children, and yourself. Why is that? Because one day, if you're doing it right, your kids are going to leave. If you're doing it right. The biggest tragedy of all is you look over at your spouse and you say, after your kids leave the house, and you go, who are you again? You lost the connection because you prioritize your kids. I'm not saying hate your kids. I'm not saying don't spend time with your kids. I am saying, though, your spouse should have priority over your children. And if you're marrying into a blended family, if you have existing children, and you're going to marry a, a man, okay, or a woman, if you can't put that new husband or that new wife above your existing children, you're marrying the wrong person. That's a big statement to make. But you've got to prioritize your spouse because what happens if you don't? If all your energy is spent on your children, your spouse quietly in the back of their heart is thinking to themselves, I used to matter that much to them. Boy, I, I hate getting the leftovers after the kids. They're never going to tell you that. But what starts to happen is resentment starts to build. And it just eats away and erodes the hope that we're looking to have. Did it just get warmer in here? You guys are staring daggers at me right now. I saw arms crossing like, Pastor, nope. Weird use crossed a very delicate line. No, I trust me. Let me take a big deep breath. Let it out. We're all friends here. 
We're all friends here. No harm meant, just to say, hey, if this shakes up your world, I'm spo it's supposed to, it's the truth. Man, it's important. Prioritize your spouse. Because when you start doing these things, you start putting your spouse above your kids, big things can happen. That intimacy grows between the two of you. Again, you're one, not you and the kids. Next one, and the last one of the things to do, pardoning. Pardoning, that means just forgiveness, forgiving those that you love. When you forgive your spouse for something they've done in the past, it doesn't mean they were right, doesn't mean they win, doesn't give them permission to do it again. You know what forgiveness does? It allows your marriage to move forward. And you say, well, pastor, you don't know what they did to me. I don't. But I know the value of being able to forgive and move forward. I do a lot of weddings, and every time I do a wedding, I tell the story of the prodigal son. If you've never heard it before, the prodigal son is a, a story where a kid goes out, he takes his inheritance early from his dad. You know, he says, Dad, you're not dead yet, but can I have the money I'm gonna get when you die? And dad says, all right. So he gives his, his kid the money, and he goes out, and he spends it. And he expects to come home and his dad to punish him and be really angry. And every day his dad goes down to the end of the driveway and waits for his son to come home. And one day his son comes home and he's kind of, he's been eating pig slop, he's spent all of his money, he's ashamed, and he expects his dad to punish him and really be angry. And look, look at how his dad responds. I put this in your outline, it's from the book of Luke, verse 50, or chapter 15, verse 22. It said, his father said to the servants, this is again, the sons come home. Dad says, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Well, that's unexpected. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Now, I can understand the sandals, right? Maybe the son came home barefoot. Get him, give him some shoes. And I can understand maybe he didn't have a shirt on, so get him a robe. But why the ring? Because I think maybe when his son looks at that ring that he's wearing down the road, he'll remember that his father forgave him. Now, if you're married today and you're wearing a wedding ring, can I just ask you to just to take a glance at it really quickly? Every time you look at that wedding ring, here's what it should tell you, just like it told the prodigal son, that you have a father too that has forgiven you for so much. God has forgiven me for so much. And when I look down at my wedding ring, it reminds me that how much God has forgiven me, so I need to forgive my spouse in the same way. Forgiveness isn't given because they deserve it. It's not even forgiven because they've earned it. Maybe they haven't even asked for it. Forgiveness is given because God has first forgiven you. It's an act of love. It's time to move past the past. And if we're gonna bring hope to the future, we have to remember, when we look down at that ring, man, God's forgiven us for so, so much. So, we have evaluated where we are, we've decided we're gonna work and not wish. Here's the last thought for the day, we're done. Number three, keep your promise. Keep your promise. I do a lot of weddings. <coughs> I've done a Jedi wedding. That was cool. <laughs> we all wore Jedi robes and there was lightsabers, you know, when the bride walks out and they walk under. It was, it was awesome. It was lit, as they would say. <laughs> it's pathetic to see a middle-aged guy say the word lit from a stage, but <laughs> sorry. I've done a wedding where I had 105 degree temperature. I've done a wedding where there was a fist fight that broke out between the best man and the dad. Yeah, rough, huh? I've seen a dog, I've seen a, a wedding, I've done a wedding with a dog ring bearer. It sounds so cute, doesn't it? Don't do it. <laughs> Believe it or not, dogs don't know the script. They tied the ring to the dog's neck and the dog took off. <laughs> so they had to go chase the rings down the block. Cute on paper, terrible execution. You know what every single one of those weddings had in common besides the DJ playing YMCA? They all had vows. Every single wedding I've ever done have had wedding vows. You know what a vow is? It's a promise, it's a commitment. It's not conditional, it's not, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll honor my commitment if you honor yours, or my husband honors his and I'll, I'll do what I'm supposed to do too, or I, maybe I don't feel like it today, or it's a promise that you make to your spouse forever. Forever is from the Greek meaning forever. Until what? Death do you part. They matter. But I talked to so many people looking for a way out of their vows. But pastor, you don't understand. I made the, I made the promise and I get all that, but, 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 but and there's, there's a bunch of excuses that I hear. I put three of them in your outline. 
Three of the most popular. Here's the first one that I hear all the time. I know I promised to keep my commitments. I know I took a vow, but my marriage is too far gone. I've seen marriages come back from multiple affairs. I've seen marriages where there's been divorce papers written up on a judge's desk and they get shredded. I've seen marriages where the husband does a 180 unexpectedly or the wife does a 180 unexpectedly. Look at the verse I put there in your outline. I love this verse. Luke 137. What's that first word? Let's say it like we feel it. Nothing you see is impossible with God. Circle that word, nothing. I hear all the time, my marriage is too far gone. Look at that word. That word says nothing is impossible to God. Oh, but you don't understand. This is, oh, it's falling, it's, I shouldn't have to honor my commitment because it's just falling apart. God says, if you're willing to work at it, nothing's impossible. I can do it all. Nothing. I wrote this in my notes. God created the universe. He parted seas. He leveled armies. He caused the sun to stop in the sky. He kept his people safe through the desert for 40 years. He protected Daniel from the lion's den. He sent his son Jesus not just to be here, but to die and resurrect from the dead three days later. He started his church, which still stands today. And every single day, God knows how many heart, times your heart beats and how many uh, teardrops fall down your face when you hurt. That's the God we serve. That's how powerful God is. And if God can do all of that, God can fix your marriage. And as we just talked about, it's not an automatic thing. He's not going to sprinkle pixie dust over it, and it's all of a sudden going to be great. It's going to take work on your part, too, and my part. But nothing is impossible through God. I put in my notes, as long as your marriage is still legal, it's still living. It may need a little resuscitation, but there's hope. Don't quit on your vows. Here's the second thing I hear all the time. I know I promised my spouse forever, but they aren't changing. I thought they'd change, but they haven't changed, and well, it's time to cash it in. I've learned two things about change. You cannot change another human being. Did you know that? You ever try? <laughs> Waste of time. Because we think we're doing a great job, and all of a sudden, we're, what? I thought we were getting along here. You can't change another person. Only two people can, God and themselves. The only part of your marriage that you can change is you. Be the spouse God has called you to be regardless of your other spouse. Change yourself. Work on yourself. And know this at the same time. I love this verse from Isaiah 43. God says this. God says, for I am about to do something, what? New. I like that. I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? Here's the fact. God cares more about your marriage than you do. And God is working in the heart of your spouse in ways that you can't even see yet. And you're so frustrated. He won't change. She won't change. You know what? God says in this passage, look, something new is coming. I'm already working and in in, in changing their heart. I'm whispering to their soul. I'm doing things to them that you can't even begin to see. Don't quit on your vows before I get a chance to show you the work I've been doing, God says. God is working on the heart of your spouse. Why? Because he cares more about your marriage than you do. He loves your spouse more than you do, and he loves you more than you love yourself. Your marriage matters to him. He's busily at work in the heart of your spouse. Don't give up your vows. I put a verse there. It's on the screens. It's not in your outline. Galatians. Paul's writing to the churches in Galatia. Chapter 6, verse 9. He says this. Paul says, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Far too many marriages end in divorce right before the breakthrough. We give up. And this passage of scripture tells us if we keep doing what is good and we don't give up on our vows and we keep pushing and keep growing and keep learning and keep persevering, what does it say? Harvest of blessing. Church, I believe with my whole heart that the best years of your marriage have yet to come. No matter what you've already gone through, no matter all the great times you've had, that your best years are still ahead no matter how old you are. We just got to keep and stay the course. 
I wanna give you three quick things before we go. These were given to me on my wedding day by a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Roy Campbell. He actually performed our wedding and he's gone home to be with the Lord since then, but I was nervous on my wedding day, as you can imagine. I was, uh, how old was I? Young, <laughs> I don't know, 22, something like that. Uh, gonna marry the woman of my dreams and um, I was pacing around backstage. You know, back behind them. This was an old school church. We didn't, I didn't get married here. And there was a baptistry and some stairs. And I'm just walking around, you know. That morning I got up and cleaned my whole kitchen. Because I, so, I was so nervous. I didn't know what to do. I'm pacing around. And finally he grabs a hold of my arm. He says, Brian, I want to tell you three things. I want to give them to you. They've served me well for the last 25 years. I hope they'll serve your marriage too. Number one, love your spouse even when they're not being very lovable. Did you know that everybody from time to time, including me, and honestly, the Seriously, jackpot right here, right? No. Everybody from time to time is unlovable. When your spouse is being grouchy and unlovable, that's when they need your love the most. But it's the time you want to push them away. Get you straighten out, then they won't. No, no. Love your spouse, even when they're being unlovable. Look at the second one. Fill this in if you would. Believe in your spouse, even when they don't believe in themselves. Because your spouse is out in a world right now telling them they're not good enough. They don't look good enough. Maybe it's a physicality thing. Maybe it's a job thing. Maybe it's on the road. You don't drive well enough. You're not a good enough mom. You're not a good enough dad. You need to be, if you're married, your spouse's biggest cheerleader. I don't care what the world says about you. I don't care what your parents say about you. I believe in you. What an incredible hope builder that statement is. I believe in you. Even when you don't believe in yourself, I know you can do it. Those are the kind of things that just put a Band-Aid on your soul. You just want to give somebody a big hug and say, thank you for believing in me. Because sometimes in a big world like this, your spouse is the only one who does. That's by God's design. It builds intimacy and hope. Here's the last one. Fight for your spouse even when the world tells you to move on. Because here's the thing, your marriage may be at a state where you go talk to your friends about it and they're like, you know what? You're done. You've done all you can. And you get marriage books and they're like, well, you've put up with all you need to put up with. It's time to step out. I wanna challenge that thinking. Fight for your spouse. Fight for your vows. And if you're the only one fighting for your marriage right now, keep going. You may be lonely and may say, hey, I, it's so hard, isn't it, when I'm the only one that seems to care? Keep living your faith out in front of your spouse. Keep fighting for those vows. I found this verse in Romans 12. Now, I've read this verse a 100 times, but it really does fit marriage well. It says, rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Rejoicing knowing that hope is coming. Be patient when it gets tough, because it does. And never stop giving it to God. What a huge verse. Please fill this in if you would. Never give up hope that things will change for the better. Never give up hope that things can change for the better. I wanna end our time together today by sharing a story. I never met this guy, but I read his story. Lives in California, married to his wife for 55 years. And every week they would go on a date. They'd go get burgers and fries. I think it was in and out They'd go there every single week and they'd have a burger and fries and maybe not the healthiest meal, but certainly the healthiest time together. And they'd sit there and they'd talk about their marriage and they would share things that they were good, they were happy about. They would share you know, challenges they were feeling. They would just get it out there. And once a week, they'd sit down over a burger and fries and just communicate from the heart. I wanna show you a picture of a recent date from this guy. Now what you may notice in the picture as he sits by himself, but look what's on the table. It's a picture of his wife. He still shares moments with his wife. He still values the time they had together. 55 years. 
Now, I'd love to tell you this is science fiction. This is an anomaly and only happens once in a while. It doesn't. This type of love and devotion can happen in the marriage you're in right now. They ask him. They said, what's the secret to a long marriage? And here's what his quote was. He said, people are like candles. At a moment, a breeze can blow it out. So enjoy the light while you have it. Tell your wife that you love her every day. I know some of the things I said today were super challenging. It was my prayer before I came out to speak about this, and I pray about it in the wing. I said, God, just give me words to say. I'm not perfect at this either. But I know that anything worth having is worth fighting for. And, and, And your marriage can be like this one, where the connection goes even beyond physicality. It's just, I just want to spend time with my wife. I just want to spend time with my husband. It's not a far-fetched dream. It just takes work. If you're fighting alone and you're struggling to keep your marriage together, fight on. Keep going. God's doing a work in your spouse's life that you don't even see yet. Don't quit on those vows. Because the connection that will be created, that hope that will be restored, will last both 55 years and way beyond it. A strong marriage can change generations. Be the example in your family of what a Christ-centered, strong marriage should be. I will certainly, with all my heart, be praying for you as you do. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you as a group, and God, I pray over each and every married person here that God, that they would be courageous today to maybe start a dialogue they've never thought they'd ever have with their spouse or one that's been neglected a long time ago. Father, I pray for rejuvenation, renewal, for hope. Because I know, God, that when we take that step, we put that foot in the water, that you have blessings to pour out on our marriages that we have no idea what's coming. We thank you for that. I pray for those in the room today that are single, that they're searching for that man or that woman, God, that would complete them. God, I would ask that you would just remind them in their spirit, God, that that men and women don't complete each other. You complete us. But that, Father, right now they are whole in you. And that whatever man or whatever woman you may lead them to in the future, that that they would just take this information that we've heard about today and just hide it away in their heart so that their marriages can start on the right foot. And I pray for those in the room today that, Father, that find themselves single again. Maybe they've gone through a painful divorce or two, and God, they're wondering, can they even trust anyone anymore? I would ask, God, that you would renew their hope that strong marriages not only are possible, but through you, Father, they can happen beyond our wildest dreams. Father, bless the unions in this room Bless the husband, bless the wife, and let today be the first step, Father, towards unity and hope, and we're going to give you all the glory for it. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much.